Okay, hello everybody and welcome again to the Monroe Center for Healthy Aging. I'm Dave McNew, the Operations Manager for the Center, and we are here with another exciting uh, episode of Off Your Rocker program. Um, today we have Vicki Loveland. Vicki is here talking about alcohol today, alcohol awareness and the long-term effects of alcohol. So um, with that said, uh, Vicki Loveland from the Monroe County Substance Abuse Coalition. Welcome, Vicki. Thank you. So I did talk to Sandy as I was putting this presentation together, and it is on alcohol and the long-term effects on the body. But I've also added a component, um, as you probably know, our state recently passed um, marijuana for recreational use. And so I did add the last part of my presentation will include some information on, on the legalization of marijuana. So I don't want to throw you as I get into that. So thank you for having me today. Um, as he said, I'm with the Monroe County Substance Abuse Coalition. I'm the development coordinator, and I always have to give a thank you to the United Way. Um, I am housed at the United Way, which is on North Monroe Street here in Monroe, um, and they have been our fiscal agent for the dollars that are received in our coalition for almost 13 years now. Back in 2006, our coalition was formed. And we do not use any United Way campaign dollars for the coalition. We are federally funded out of um, Washington, D.C. And we um, can't thank United Way enough for being our supporter for all of these years. Our coalition is also very fortunate that we have over 30 individuals and agencies that are a part of our monthly meetings and our work groups um, and who participate when we try to combat um, substance abuse prevention among our youth is our main focus. So um, I am getting a little bit out of my, my subject today and talking about adults, so I will try to answer any questions that you have at the end. So when we look at the data here in Monroe County, we look at three different adult variables when it comes to adult drinking. And we recently were able to get our hands on some data through the Building Healthy Communities Coalition through the Monroe County Health Department. And they looked at three variables. One, um, in surveying our adults on whether they had had a drink in the past month. Another question was if they were a binge drinker, and that means for women having more than four drinks on one occasion, and for men it's more than five drinks on one occasion. And then have you um, drove after you've had too much alcohol to drink? So we have data from 2016 and 18, and I'm sorry for those that can't see it. Um, and then we do a comparison to the state of Michigan and then nationwide. Unfortunately, if we look at our data, Monroe County for 2018 is actually higher when it comes to drinking in the past month for adults, whether they binge drank or whether they drove after having too much alcohol. So this data is recently new and we are working together as a team to come up with strategies in regards to why this is happening in Monroe County and what we can do to raise awareness around this and do some better education. So when we look at the, the binge drinking, as I just said, it's the four drinks and the five drinks depending whether you're a male or a female. There's different ways of looking at how much is considered a standard drink. So as you can see here by this chart, I have four different drinks that are, are pictured. We have a beer, we've got malt liquor, or they're called craft beers, and then wine, and then the spirits, such as a shot of vodka, whiskey, tequila. And so our alcohol by volume, it really is how much, how much alcohol is contained in a certain volume. So if we look at the difference here, we have a 12 fluid ounce of regular beer that has about 5% of alcohol in it. But if we look at the malt liquor, which is another type of beer, it's only eight or nine ounces, but it actually has about 7% of alcohol on it. And then if you have a shot of vodka or whiskey or tequila, you're looking at about 40% of alcohol, and that's one and a half ounces of alcohol. So quite the difference when we're looking at standard drinks. So if someone says, you know, they've had, you know, three drinks, but they've got two shots that's in there, you know, in their glass, maybe it's mixed with club soda or something, we're actually looking at two standard drinks instead of just one. And so the binge drinking, um, I, I, I've mentioned this, and all the research that I've done, it's quite interesting. They talk about, you know, having five or more drinks on one occasion for a man, but how do we define one occasion? And some of the websites and some of the research that I found, they actually noted that it could be two hours or less. So if you've consumed five drinks, going back to that chart that I just referenced, in five hours or less, that's considered binge drinking. Um, an occasion can also be defined as maybe a couple of hours, an evening out. 
Um, and so it's really how the occasion is defined. But we also know that binge drinking is also related to our blood alcohol concentration. So many of you have probably have heard 0.08 or higher is considered you know, being impaired. And if you actually are pulled over and you are given the breathalyzer and it's 0.08 or higher, you can be arrested for driving under the influence of alcohol. So that's also related to binge drinking. Um, the thing I want to note too here at the bottom is that most people who binge drink are not considered alcohol dependent. And I'm going to get into that a little bit more in the next slide with the alcohol use disorder. And so alcohol use disorder is actually a medical diagnosis. Um, our clinicians, our therapists, and I'll get into that in the next slide, actually use a manual to help um, you know, decide whether somebody actually has this disorder to diagnose them. And so it does have to do with the brain. It's a chronic relapsing brain disease. And it's characterized by these different um, areas up here. Whether someone is using alcohol on a, in a compulsive way, whether they are at a loss of how much alcohol they're actually consuming, and then also what kind of state are they in when they're not using alcohol? Is it a negative emotional state? And all of that is related to alcohol use disorder, which again is a medical diagnosis. And so this is the part of the manual that I just referred to. It's called the DSM-5 is kind of the acronym. It's a Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. And so clinicians and therapists will use this. And what it is, is when it comes to alcohol use disorder, there are 11 questions that are usually asked of the person. And it really looks at the person's usage in the past year when it comes to their drinking patterns and habits. And so in the past, there was a diagnosis of alcohol abuse and another diagnosis of alcohol dependence. It's now been combined to actually be alcohol use disorder, AUD. And so um, when you look at these 11 questions, if there's the presence or you're answering yes to at least two of the questions, there is a possibility of having a diagnosis of alcohol use disorder. However, the severity is defined by mild, moderate, or severe, and that depends on how the questions, again, are answered. So one of the things that changed with the DSM-5, because this manual is continuously updated, there was a DSM-4, now there's a DSM-5, and they did add the question, um, if you were asked, is, have you ever wanted to drink so badly that you couldn't think of anything else? So one of the questions they asked out of the 11 here. So unfortunately, I know some of you probably can't see this in the back, but one of the other questions is spent a lot of time drinking, or were you sick or getting over other after effects the next day after drinking? So some of the questions they asked, and again, it looks at your last year, your pattern of drinking as they go through these lists of questions. And so the other concern that um, we look at when it comes to alcohol use is really um, what it, how does it affect women differently than men? And so it does have a, an effect on women differently. Some of the risk can be um, more for women, and really that has to do with the amount of water that we store in our body, the fact that women's body structure and chemistry is differently, and on average, women do weigh less than men, and the way they metabolize the alcohol is differently. So some of the studies that have been done on women that have admitted to um, you know, drinking alcohol, some of the harms that can come with that are the hangovers, of course, blackouts, brain atrophy, um, faster progression of the alcohol use disorder that I just discussed in the previous slide, and then certain cancers um, are more riskier for women that drink alcohol excessively on a regular basis. So the other thing I want to know is that if women, you know, are they're less likely to seek treatment for an alcohol use disorder than men. And there can be various reasons because of that. Um, you know, some of the research that I found is maybe because of the domestic responsibilities at home. If they're taking care of a family and children, if they're taking care of a loved one, maybe an ailing family member. Um, maybe not just recognizing or in denial that they actually may have this disorder. And so they're less likely to get that treatment and then the long-term effects on them for not getting the treatment for that disorder. And so why do people use substances like alcohol? These are two ads um, that have been used in the past. And so, you know, it can produce a positive state. And so it's positive reinforcement to actually use alcohol. 
or it's to fix a negative state. And so you can see here, for those that can see, this ad is experiments and pleasure. So it produces that positive state. And then to fix a negative state, the ad reads, restores the balance. And so we know with research that men tend to drink more so to produce a positive state. And then for women, it's more so to fix that negative state, that it's really pushed by something that may be occurring in their life that is negative, and so they're drinking to kind of make that negative state disappear. And so some of the short-term health risk, um, I will say most of them are tied with the result of that binge drinking, so having an excessive amount of alcohol in a short amount of time. I don't think any of these are too surprising when it comes to the short-term health risk. We have injuries, violence, alcohol poisoning that can occur, which I know that we hear more so about that with our younger population, college students, maybe sorority fraternities, drinking so much to an excessive amount that it does cause you know, alcohol poisoning, risky sexual behavior, and then of course with women, miscarriage and stillbirth. You know, I'll mention this about, you know, there's fetal alcohol syndrome that can be a diagnosis with, you know, a child. And I still think there are still some misconceptions out there, um, myself included many years ago when I was seeing a doctor in regards to, you know, what is a safe amount to drink? And I'll never forget him telling me that, you know, a, an occasional glass of wine was okay. And me being a social worker in, in the field that I'm in gave a nice lecture back to him. We don't know the amount of alcohol or how do you know my genetic disposition to tell me to have a glass of wine occasionally as I'm pregnant with my unborn child. So, um, you know, the best way for pregnant women is just simply not to drink at all throughout their pregnancy. And so some of the long-term health risks when it comes to, um, you know, excessive use of alcohol obviously has to do with the heart. Um, we have here, you know, high blood pressure, congestive heart failure, stroke, um, heart disease in general. And again, going back to women, when it comes to women and our heart health and drinking, we know that the damage to the heart muscle for women can be more than it is for men, even when women drink lesser amounts. And I believe that goes back to what I said about the way we store our, our body fat, the fact on average that we weigh less than men and that we have less body water within our systems and that's where alcohol is held at. And so the other long-term effects um, uh, specifically are cancers here and um, obviously the breast cancer in relation to women, it puts them at a higher risk for breast cancer if they actually you know, drink an excessive amount. And one of the reasons for this is maybe that that particular woman is lacking folate, which is considered a B vitamin, and it's really the help, the, to help make the red and the white bone marrow. And so if they are lacking in folate, um, and they're also consuming alcohol, it can certainly increase their risk because it can also raise the estrogen levels as well. And then the liver cancer, the damage that alcohol can do on your liver um, and you know, causing the inflammation and the swelling, and then as it, you know, the liver starts to repair itself, the scar tissue that can be left is all related to you know, increasing um, liver cancer, colon cancer, and then of course the mouth and throat cancer as well. And then going back to this, women are at higher risk than men with these specific um, liver disease, impact on the brain, the impact on the heart, like I said, cancers, and then sexual assault. And so the long-term health risk as well, um, we also, I think this is kind of funny, but they were talking about, you know, drinking alcohol is not one way to improve your memory. And I think we all, you know, I, I, I kind of have a smile on my face, but we know it causes that impairment. And so, you know, when people talk about being, you know, impaired the night before, they may not even remember what they have done the night before. So we certainly know that over time, excessive alcohol will not contribute to improving your memory. There is also something called alcohol-related dementia, and really it's very much associated with the symptoms of regular dementia. It's, you know, the alcohol is causing direct damage to the brain cells. And as the person is intoxicated and they go back through that withdrawal, the back and forth and what happens on their brain can actually cause alcohol-related dementia. And again, same signs, extreme confusion, um, being disoriented, maybe unsteadiness on their feet. Um, we do know that alcohol-related dementia, it can be reversed. Um, we know that if the person receives good support and remains alcohol-free, it is something that they can eventually come out of, but remaining alcohol-free and getting that support is very important to coming out of that. 
And then the other long-term effect is the effect that it can have on our mental health. Um, we know that alcohol is a depressant, and so you know we look at depression, anxiety, along with antisocial behavior, psychosis, being out of touch with reality. And so looking at this cycle right here, you know, we drink to relax, we feel better for a little while, and then that natural happy chemicals known as serotonin in the brain, they actually decrease. And so serotonin is related to depression. It's a chemical related to depression. So if we're depleting that, and then we come out of being impaired, now our anxiety has increased again, and our depression could also increase. So definitely the effect it can have on our mental health um, is something to be concerned about as well. And then the long-term health effects. I think these are kind of no-brainers. You know, the social problems that it can cause, lost productivity, whether it be at home or in the workplace, just not being as effective, the family problems that it can cause, going back to those short-term risk factors, such as violence in the home. And then, of course, with the lost productivity, that can very well be related to becoming unemployed as well. So if you or if you know someone who may be struggling with alcohol, um, this is a great you know, website if you have access. It's the National Institute on Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism. And it's a great navigator. And it's not just about finding treatment for you and the community that you live in, but it really takes you through some steps, some questions to ask. You know, what makes a good you know, treatment facility? What would be the best option for you? What are you, you know, struggling with? And then, of course, you always have to check with your health insurance as well to determine you know, what facilities here in Monroe that will accept you. But this would be a great place to start to get some of those questions um, you know, answered as you're looking for local help in Monroe. So this is where I change over to marijuana. And I'm going to talk a little bit about our state of Michigan. We legalized marijuana in November of 2018, and it officially became legal on December 6th, a month later. And that had to do with the election and ensuring that the results were there. So even though we voted back in November, it was a month later that it actually became legal. And so it was known as Proposal 1. And for the state of Michigan, you can see here how we voted. We had almost 56% of our population in Michigan voted to legalize this for recreational use. So I'm not talking medical marijuana. I'm talking recreational use. And then we had around 44% that did not support this. And so right now, um, we have until December of 2019, they are called dispensaries, and they will actually have the rules and the regulations rolled out in December of 2019 in regards to what a dispensary should look like if they happen to open up in the state of Michigan, specifically even Monroe County. I know right now, many of our municipalities have opted out of their to be quite honest, they're tired of getting the phone calls because they don't have an answer yet from the state of Michigan in regards to what the rules and regulations will be. So they've opted out to accepting any type of interest in somebody opening up a dispensary until these rules are better defined. So I don't believe, and I believe even hearing from our law enforcement, that we have not felt the full effect of this being legalized yet. Um, and we'll probably more so after December of 2019 of what our community will look like. And also our law enforcement made a very interesting comment last week. I was at a, a luncheon through our Chamber of Commerce, and he said it was interesting as the days started to get nicer out, the phone calls into law enforcement agencies increased regarding marijuana. Um, a neighbor had called, or a person had called in and said their neighbor the smell of it, you know, them being outside in their backyard. And the law enforcement official said, there's really nothing I can do. Us as residents voted for this, and it's legal, and if they're smoking it in their backyard, you're going to have to deal with it, or you're going to have to move. So that was the response. And so how Michigan counties voted, the green is yes, the red is no. In Monroe County, we voted yes. We had 32,337 people that wanted this. We had 29,084 residents that did not want it. Just to show you our um, registered voters in 2019, actually that should be 2018, was 118,000. Sorry, I had something come up on this. So we did vote for this in Monroe County. Um, as you can see, much of the Upper Peninsula was against this. Obviously, the upper part of the Lower Peninsula was against it as well. Is the orange against it? Yes. It's no. Oh, shoot. Sorry, guys. Okay, 
So marijuana, um, I put some pictures up up here of you know a marijuana joint, there's a bong, there's a pipe, the leaf marijuana. It's just not the same as it used to be. And so you'll hopefully understand this a little bit better as I get through a couple of the slides. And so um, as we move through this, marijuana is also called dab. It's marijuana concentrate. And so let me tell you, I've had to wrap my head around this and, and, and educate myself, talk to law enforcement to understand this. It's very confusing. The one thing you need to remember in all of this is the leaf marijuana has much, much, much less THC, which is the mind-altering component of marijuana, than these marijuana concentrates. And so um, I'm going to explain to you how a marijuana concentrate is brought out of leaf marijuana. And we have here kind of a picture description. We've got butane, yes, that is butane. And I've watched a lot of videos, talked to law enforcement on how this is done in someone's home. And they take a, a long plastic tube like that, they take the leaf marijuana, put it into the plastic tube, put this coffee filter over it after they've drilled a couple holes at the one end. And then what they do is they pop the top off the butane, put it in and it extracts out all of the THC, that high, high potent that causes the mind altering part. And they also advise you to wear a mask over your face because of using the butane. If it causes a spark or something, it obviously can be very, very, very fatal. And so the dangerous path, the marijuana concentrates. And we like to think that it's not happening here in Monroe. This is out of the Monroe Evening News in December, or October of 2017. City resident injured in cannabis oil explosion at home. And I just actually talked to one of our city law enforcement about this and he said yes, you know, the follow up to this, he said when they walked in, immediately knew that it was a cannabis explosion. So certainly not something that you know, we worry about our youth in our community trying to do this at home. Um, you know, the YouTube through our internet is something that you can find so many, you know, do it at home items, and that's the scariest part, I think. And so these are the different, depending on the, that extraction process that I, I showed you quickly there, and you know, they use a heating pad. And so depending on the extraction process, there's different forms. So there's something called shatter. I like to compare this to like peanut brittle, there's oils, which is more the consistency of like a Carmex lip balm, and then there's like a butter. All of these are, can be used in like marijuana edibles, such as brownies, cookies, um, the edibles that you know can be made at home. The one thing again I'm going to go back to is the potency for all of these is significantly higher. Over 80% THC in the shatter. For leaf marijuana, the average of THC is anywhere from 10 to 20%. So I, you know, we've talked about youth at schools that are using this. We had a situation at a local high school at homecoming, two girls had used the marijuana concentrates, said they took a couple of you know, hits off of it. They were found on the bathroom floor and the school staff had no idea what they were dealing with. So the marijuana is not what it used to be. So these are marijuana edibles. These images are taken off of Colorado, is legalized for recreational use and has been since 2012. These images are taken off of websites. You can go there. Obviously, I can't purchase anything, but I've navigated through um, because you know there's a process and because I'm not a resident of Colorado. But these are some of the description. Winter mints, incredibles, marijuana high suckers. Um, they have the, the cannabis over there, the toffee chocolate, the fantastic brownie. All of these are considered marijuana edibles. So interesting, I found this through the Today Show had a special on one day and so I went back and found it. And this doctor here, he is the physician and the journalist. And so those who use edibles should use a much lower dose and should not redose until at least four hours later. That was his advice as part of the Today Show segment. And so we know that people eating the marijuana candies and the food out in Colorado, severe panic attacks or other sudden mental disorders because of that THC level and because of you know, the edibles and you know, the amount that's being consumed at the time. So another thing I wanna note from Colorado is that they do have an array of dispensaries out there right now and they know that about you know 10% of people that are going to the emergency department because they're associated with you know using marijuana edibles it's about 10% but the ironic part is is that only about 0.32% they've been able to kind of you know look at the dispensaries and what they're selling are only because of the edibles so 0.32% are being sold as marijuana edibles but we have over 10% 
showing up at the hospital. So people obviously are still using it or growing it in their home. People don't know what they're getting their hands on and they're ending up in the ER because there's just no regulation behind it at all. So facts about edibles. This is something the coalition put out to our schools and our parents, um, kind of just giving some quick facts. Again, I go back to the THC levels. You know, we know that they are around maybe 4% in the 1980s, and then with the leaf marijuana, it went to 20 or 30%. But with the marijuana concentrates, it can be anywhere from 40 to 80%. And we just don't have a lot of testing. It's still illegal at the federal level. And so when people ask, we don't have the funds are not distributed to do the testing because we're still not legal at the federal level. So all of this, you know, there's different estimates in this, but one thing is known for certain, the marijuana concentrates that are being tested are higher than the leaf marijuana. So this is a funny part too. A quarter of this cookie is considered a serving size because of the THC levels. I don't know about any of you, but I certainly eat more than a quarter of a cookie. Um, and so that's become a dilemma. And then with the marijuana edibles, because of the way that your body digests it and it's processed, the effects take a lot longer. And so you know, trying to understand that, and especially our youth, where everything is, can be impulsive or you know, they want that reaction quickly, the next thing you know, they eat the entire cookie and that's where the THC overdoses are happening. It's called marijuana greening out. So certainly continue to educating all of our community on this because like I said, I don't think we've seen the full effect yet of, of us being legalized as a recreational state. So marijuana overdose is also called greening out. Um, some of these symptoms, you know, I, I've gotten into debates with people and we know that, you know, we certainly are concerned about heroin in our community and the opioid crisis that we have going on. There are fatal overdoses from that. And with marijuana, it's still an overdose. We're still dealing with fear, anxiety, the paranoia, unconsciousness and hallucinations, all of those things that I talked about earlier where they are ending up in the emergency department out in Colorado. So it is, there is overdose on marijuana and again, it's called greening out. And so I did bring a couple of um, charts that if any of you are interested, um, and I will tell you, I get questioned all the time, yes, it's spelled with an H here. And a lot of this has to do with the 1937 marijuana tax law, and then our public health code adopted it with the H, and so any of the state governing laws still use the H. And so this is actually came from our local prosecutor's office, and they are using the H because they are the ones who distribute it. Honestly, it can be spelled either way, but if you see it with an H, it's not wrong, and I had to discover that myself. So it's a one-page penalty chart here. I know that our prosecutor's office is struggling as well. Um, it's very clouded and convoluted right now because of the law and just becoming recreational. Um, last week at the luncheon that I was at, our prosecutor mentioned that they're probably gonna see a lot less prosecutions with this you know, becoming legal for the recreational use. It's just simply not on their radar in regards to when you, you have it and it's legal for a recreational use. And the other thing that we're struggling with is law enforcement, when they're pulling someone over and determining there is really no roadside test that can be administered besides what they're walking you through when they suspect alcohol. There's not a breathalyzer they can give. So um, I hopefully will see some changes with that. So if you would like a copy of that, I'll leave them on the table over here. And then I also shared with Sandy, um, this is an overview of the law in general, the recreational law. I only have five copies because this one was a little longer, but she said she'd be more than happy to make um, copies for everyone. And that, this one is one page. So I thank you for letting me be here today. Um, you're welcome to join us. We have monthly coalition meetings um, at Salvation Army Harbor Light on Monroe Street. Um, again, I'm located at the United Way. If you have any questions or um, if you want me to do a different presentation, I would be happy to. Um, but if anybody has any questions at this point, I try to answer them the best that I can. Her question is, is there any chance of it getting into the stores? So the dispensaries are what we're referring to as the stores. We do not have any at this point that have opened in the state of Michigan because of the laws and the policies not rolling out until December of this year. At that point, municipalities have the decision whether they want to allow dispensaries within their own little area, so opting in or opting out. So we won't know more of that until, but 
the marijuana will have to be sold through dispensaries. Like you won't be able to walk into Meyer and buy it there. And that she asked, what would happen if you were in a house party and somebody were serving marijuana edibles, you know, knowing the difference? You don't. And you really have to count on your host or your hostess to share that with you. Um, we had a fair booth. I mean, if they're making it in their home and it's sitting out on the counter and you decide to grab one and they're in the other room talking away and they haven't told you that it's a marijuana infused brownie, then there's a chance you could take it. I mean, we had a booth at the fair last year, our coalition did, and the stories that we heard about youth consuming items. I mean, most of the schools have banned any homemade items coming in, and there's various reasons for that. The peanut allergy, but one of the reasons the high schools have banned it is because marijuana edibles, brownies, cookies, and that were being brought into the schools, and kids weren't realizing what they, well, they might have realized what they were bringing in, but they were sharing it with others and then the effects of that were felt by other students. It depends on you know your reaction to it, and especially with the edibles. I mean, because of the high amount of THC, it could go back to one of those you know greening out, whether hallucinating or losing unconsciousness, fast pulse. It depends on how your body reacts to it. Yeah. Is there no smell or taste to it? Um, with the marijuana concentrates, I mean, like if there's a cookie that's got it, you can't very little. They can have a smell to them, but it's very easy to conceal and disguise. And so I really didn't get into this, but there's the electronic, you know, cigarettes. Those marijuana concentrates can be used in the e-cigarettes as well. And so our schools are struggling with this, one, because the e-cigarettes shouldn't even be used in the school, whether it's liquid nicotine or not. But then what they do is they use like a floral scent or a candy scent, and it disguises the smell even more. So it's very easy to conceal. Can you tell me whether alcoholism is hereditary? He asked if I can tell you if alcoholism is hereditary. I don't have a lot of information on that, you know, just the knowledge that I have from myself. I mean, I had a grandfather that was an alcoholic, and so I had parents who told me, you know, you got to be careful. I don't have a lot of, like, I'm, I don't have the nursing background or anything like that, so I don't know how to answer that completely for you. Sorry. Is the green not the same as, as a, having a contact high? That used to that's the old-fashioned way. He asked if greening out is the same way as having a contact high. I mean, again, I think it goes on how your body reacts. And so, you know, having that high of, you know. There used to be cigarettes. A lot of people used 90% of the world used to smoke cigarettes. Yes. Now it's maybe about 5% Yes. And, yeah, and so, and, and really, I think we're going to find out more information as this legalization moves on. I mean, from the federal level, we won't receive the funding to do research and testing, but, you know, maybe at a state level. So it's, it's, hard, to, it's hard to say. So, question in the back there? Yeah, uh, I would like to know if someone does have an alcohol problem, usually they have to decide that for themselves, but is there any place that will come and talk to that person and you get help for someone who is an alcoholic? Well, I think that would depend on the agency themselves. If they do outreach and go to the person's home, honestly, in Monroe, I believe that, you know, you'd, it'd be a phone call, a screening, self-report. I mean, it's pretty much like that, I think, for any addiction. It's self-report and where that person is at in regards to wanting the help and accepting the help. So it has to be self-report. Yeah. Um, I mean, you can try to call for somebody, but... Why does Monroe have a bona fide alcoholic treatment center? If somebody wants to try out, where do they go in Monroe? The place that I would say to try and start with would be Salvation Army Harbor Light on North Monroe Street. And again, it depends on your funding, what insurance carrier you have. I always tell people to start with your insurance but because... 90% ordered people. I, I can't answer that. I'm not employed through Salvation Army Harbor Light. I just know they're one of the treatment facilities that, you know, we do have here in Monroe. A, a real well, I know there's things happening in the community a little bit, so, I mean, like I said, I'm not employed by Salvation Army. I just know it is one of our treatment facilities, so. 
she asked about CBD oils, and it's interesting, Sandy and I just had this conversation um, before I started this presentation. CBD is the non-mind altering component of marijuana, and so I'll go back to medical marijuana really quick. When we legalized it, medical marijuana back in 2008 or 9, it really was intended for the CBD component, and so it's that non-mind altering component. As a coalition, you know, coordinator, we certainly believe there are medicinal benefits of medical marijuana. You just have to ensure that what you're getting, and if you're not buying it through a dispensary and you have your medical marijuana card, of course, that you're getting the CBD and not the THC. And Sandy just shared this with me. Um, I apparently highlight sells the CBD oils now um, by the, the liquor and the alcohol. So. Most recently, I was under the impression that you had to have a medical marijuana card to even get the CBD oils. So I was surprised to hear that they had it at Highlight, but perhaps that's changed because our governor has done some things differently since she's took office. CBD oils legal in every state? It never was medical marijuana. It was for a moment. The CBD was because I gave a presentation on it. Like I said, things change. Well, it may have yeah. Every, it's legal in every state. What he's saying is that CBD oils are legal in every state, is what he just stated, in case you didn't hear that. So, Bonnie, do you have a question? Well, I was wondering if you've ever come across uh, guidelines for seniors who would like to use uh, either marijuana or the CBD arthritis pain for pain and I think that's the hardest part that we have you know she asked if there were guidelines for seniors who want to use the CBD for arthritis or for pain in that and you know I think hopefully you know I wish I had a better answer for you because we don't have any dispensaries here in Monroe even medical marijuana dispensaries Luna Pier has talked about opening one but it has yet to open its doors and I know that um, you know having the dispensaries is not going to decrease our black market either, meaning people are still going to continue to grow it in their home. And so I know that it's becoming a, I don't want to say a new thing, but I know some people personally who are in the business now for CBD. So I hopefully will have additional information for you, but I know that I have a friend who has a friend that has um, struggled with cancer on and off, has been in and out of remission, and she truly goes up to Ann Arbor to a dispensary. She has three young children, does not want the high, totally gets the benefit of the CBD and has had extensive conversations with the person that she's getting it from through the, dis but she's going through a dispensary. So that would be the one piece of advice I would give is that, and I'm not sure how medical marijuana cards will look after December now that we are a recreational state and we have a dispensary that you could walk in and buy recreational marijuana while they have a component for medical marijuana. I don't have the answer to that yet. But I would really advise, you know, do it the right way. Get it, get a medical card and, you know, the CBD oils, if they're legal now and you can buy them at Highlight, I mean, I would hope that there's enough regulation behind that. There's still that little bit of fear that there could be some THC in there is the research that I have done. So I can't answer that officially. Or, or not authentic. Yes, or not authentic, she said. So I wish I had a better answer, but I think that, that will be yet to come. <coughs> Any other questions? Go ahead. When you go home at night, do you have a cocktail or a quarter of a cookie? <laughs> I have three young kids, so a glass of wine on Friday night is wonderful. <laughs> three young kids. So he asked if I go, I don't know if I want to repeat that question, so I'll leave it at that. Well, thank you all very much. I hope you learned something today. Um, again, I'm at the United Way, and feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions. I don't always have the answer, but I will do my best to try to get you the answer. Because let me tell you, I've done a lot of research myself, and it is mind-blowing sometimes and very confusing. So thank you all very much. Water. We take our showers with it. We make our coffee with it. But we rarely tap its true potential and just let it be itself, flowing freely into clean lakes, clear streams, and along more freshwater coastline than any other state in the country. Come realize water's true potential. Dive in to the waters of pure Michigan. Your trip begins at michigan.org. Hi, everybody.
everyone. My name is Beth. I'm the volunteer coordinator at the Monroe Center for Healthy Aging. And today we're going to spend a few extra minutes and interview one of our very dynamic uh, members at the Senior Center. This is Harry Redford. And I'm going to ask Harry some questions. Okay. Harry, how long have you lived in the Monroe area? And tell us a little something about yourself. I have lived here all my life except for four years, 1950 to 54 when I was in the Air Force, but I have lived here, worked in the old River Raisin paper mill for all my life, 45 and a half years I spent there. And uh, What did you do for them? I was, uh, well, I did a little bit of everything, but I ended up being a, an electrician. They sent me to school, they sent me to college, and may, uh, gave me a trade, and uh, I uh, worked there for 45 and a half years. Re started there two weeks after I got out of high school and retired at 65. Now you served in the, was it Air Force Air as Force, well? Yes. Was that like during this? Did you yes, explain that? Yes, it was that? 1950 to 1954, I was in the Strategic Air Command. And I was an engine mechanic on a B-36 bomber which I really loved the job and thought about making a career of it, but it didn't work out. So here I am back in Monroe. And where were you stationed, did you in, say? In uh, California, uh, Travis Air Force Base, California. It's right outside of Oakland. Okay. And a uh, very nice place to be. <laughs> Do you ever go back and visit? No, never have. Oh, never that's too bad. Why would I want to go back when I can live in Monroe? <laughs> That's an excellent point. I myself have lived in Monroe about three years now, and I absolutely love it. So I, I understand. Um, now you went to school here, and I went to Monroe. I graduated from Monroe High School, and I went to Christian C. Grade School. Is that still around? No, it's gone. It's a vacant lot over on. Uh, I forget the name of the avenue it's on, but it's gone. Oh, that's too bad. And do you still see some of your old chums? Not many, and not very often. Harry, can I ask how old are you? No. Okay, that is a, that <laughs> yeah, is a rude uh, question. I'm 87. <laughs> I'm 87. <laughs> and uh -huh. you still drive, don't you? Oh, yes. Yeah? Well, yes. <laughs> it's getting pretty exciting. But <laughs> That's funny. All right. Um, so how did you learn about the Monroe Center for Healthy Aging, and how long have you been coming here? I was looking for an apartment. I needed a place to live, and I come over here, put my name on the waiting list, and I think I went somewhere else for about six months, and they called me, and I come over here and liked it, so I moved right in, and I've been here ever since, and I am intend on staying here. It's a beautiful place. And you learned about the center because you moved into Mabel Karras? Yes. And the activities they have over here, they keep us very busy. It's, it's a good, there's always something going on. There's, they have useful classes, teach you about how to take care of yourself, how, to, how you grow older safely, and you know, all these kind of things about nutrition. All, there's, it's, uh, it's just a wonderful place over here. I know I see you in the weight room a lot. Uh, well, yeah, a little bit. Uh, <laughs> a little bit of everything is good. Right, and I know you're in uh, Moving and Grooving. How long oh, have yes. you been doing Moving and Grooving? Can you talk about that class a little bit? Uh, just a little over a year. I took us, uh, I don't sing, and uh, the leader of Moving and Grooving which is an exercise class for older people, and uh, Joe Lynn Lauterbach directs the class. I took a singing class out to the community college in the evening, and she was in the class and told me about what's going on over here, so uh, I start coming over, and it's, it's great. For us older people, keeps you loose and moving and uh, keeps you from getting old. They, she said it would, but I'm not sure yet. 
<laughs> well, I'll tell you what, when I come out and get my coffee, I uh, today you guys were going along to the hokey pokey. And of course, now I have that in my head all day. Yeah. But um, you guys always are having a blast. And I can always hear you guys singing and, and shouting and carrying on. Well, it's a good start for the day. It gets you going. And uh, if, you, if you have one of those days where you can't get up and go, you come over here and yeah, said, something will happen over here and stir you up. That's right. That's true. Now, have you taken other classes at the community center or the community college? That's really neat that you do that. Well, yeah, I have over the years different different uh, things. Just they have a such a variety of stuff. Anything you're interested in, or if you want to do a little hobby like uh, I don't know basket weaving or whatever you want to do. In my case, it was the singing class, and it's one of the best things I ever did for myself because I made uh, five or six new friends. Nice. And we started a karaoke program. We go <laughs> once a month somewhere and, and just have a good time. It, it just really is great to get out and be around people. Definitely, it will. And that's why I wanted to talk to you because I know you've got, you do, you never sit down for long. And Let's I see. think you're inspirational, the way you keep yourself moving and, and keep people involved. What did we talk about this, this school? We're going to right now. I was just going to oh, ask okay. you, um, well, I, what do you do for the community? I was babysitting my first great-grandchild. He came along and, uh, of course, you know, parents can always use help. So I was taking care of him and most in the daytime. And uh, when it came time for him to start kindergarten he said I'm not going in there if you don't go in and I said well I don't want to go in there but uh, Judy Everly Julie Everly was teaching kindergarten back then and she came out just a wonderful person she is and she took me by the arm and took me in there and she said don't worry about the kids she says I won't let you get overloaded and uh, she taught me how to get along with young people. And now I go regularly and help out in the grade schools. And uh, this is something that every senior could be doing. If you would come over here and contact us, we would get you started in a, in a kindergarten class or a first grade class and you'd make Young friends, wherever you go from now on, they'll recognize you. You get extra coffee, you get uh, <laughs> extra treatment when you go out where they work when they graduate. The class I started with has graduated and uh, they were around town working in the McDonald's and places like that and you see them all over. It just, it's just a great thing to keep you going. I'm, I'm sure they never forget you. Oh, they never do. Yeah. No, they never do. I, I can remember back in my elementary school, I remember when teachers had AIDS, and I can remember their name and what they looked like. So, yeah, that's that makes a huge impact. Yeah, I was over to, uh, the other night. One of my, my youngest boy took me over to Toledo to, we uh, went over there to visit a couple of the kids that I had in grade school. They're adults now, and they're bowling in Toledo, and we went over to watch them bowl. So. <laughs> That's awesome. But it, they, you, you never forget, they never forget you, and you've got a lifetime friend when you deal with these young children. Young children. Yeah, that is true. And what else do you do in the community? I know you're very involved with uh, visiting. Oh, yes, I uh, visit in convalescent homes. I uh, go in and take a Bible, and if the person cares, for that, we read a uh, Bible verse, and we have prayer, and we talk uh, just about, you know, some people don't have visitors. You, Some people outlive friends and family, and they're just in there, and anybody that, uh, they just love to have company, and I visit in two or three of the convalescent homes around town, and I have a friend that goes with me, and uh, we just go in and talk about whatever anybody wants to talk about. And how, how did you start doing that, Harry? Uh, when I was a child, I my best buddy's mother kind of took me in and helped raise me. And 
uh, after I grew up and graduated, I, when I went into the Air Force, I was gone for four years and I came home and I didn't see this family for quite a while. And one day I found out that she was in, uh, in a nursing home. So I went over to, to pay her a visit. And when I was younger, I wouldn't go to church with her, so uh, I took my Bible. Since then, I started going to church, and I took my Bible over, read her a Bible verse, and uh, her daughter was with me, and she sang her a hymn, and we prayed together, and this blossomed into a visitation program. And now we visit just anybody that doesn't have, you know, family or friends left, we go visit and spend time with them, just kind of try to cheer them up, which cheers me up more than it does them and keeps me busy, and this, this, is, a, this is a great thing to get into. We'll hook you up, we'll start you in the schools, we'll start you in the convalescent homes if you come over and see us. That's true. Um, you know, and I'll get my name again is Beth Berlin. I'm the volunteer coordinator here at the Monroe Center, and we'll flash my phone number. Anybody interested in helping us out? Because there is absolutely a lot to do out there, isn't there, Harry? Yes, there is. There's people out there who need you. Yep. Okay. Anything else you do in the active uh, out in the community that I'm unaware of? Uh, I can't think right now. That's fine. That's fine. I know. Like I said, I always see you in the exercising or sitting out and having a coffee talking to Dennis or some of the other fellows here. Well that's what I do best in the community <laughs> is, is sit around Panera's and places like that. That's right I've seen you at Panera's. Yeah. <laughs> it's always fun I always see you guys out and yeah. about. Well we have a group there that we solve uh, national problems. Do you? Yes. Excellent. I, we haven't had a call yet uh, from the president Not, though. Well he, yeah we need to inform him. Yes. Because I'm sure you could help. Um, do you think the uh, Monroe Center has been a benefit to you? Oh, yes. I, I don't know. My life wouldn't be near as full as it is now without being able to come over here. I spend, I, I'm here just about every day. I know. I look forward to seeing you it, every day. It, it gives you something to look forward to, somebody. I see friends here. Um, you can get, after you get older, you can get isolated. You get cut off, so to speak. And uh, you come in here and everybody's here and things are going on. It's just, uh, it's just a wonderful place for, for senior citizens. Have you brought any of your friends over here? Yes. Yeah? I don't, uh, who have you brought over? Well, you get Denny, first name if you want. Denny. Denny came over here. Oh, gee. And uh, I, think, uh, I think I brought Tom, Tom over here. Uh, I, uh, I, I really like to bring all my friends over here. This, this is just, uh, by the way, Coffee's free, so just come in and sit down and drink all the coffee you want. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for your time, Harry, and I'll look forward well, thank to... Thank you for inviting me. I appreciate it. Great.